you've been listening carefully so far this morning, it seems that all of our readings today put us on the very edge of one thing and looking into another. The, the decisions that the people in these stories make are earth-shaking. Of course, we can start with what we just heard about Jesus on the edge of the wilderness where he's lived for 40 days, just like the 40 days and 40 nights in Lent, I might point out. And now he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan overlooking Jerusalem. Satan, who t tempts the starving Savior to bow down and worship him. Of course, we know how Jesus responded. We just heard, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so we also stand at the edge in the two other scriptures as well. In the first Hebrew Bible reading, we're in the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent and that fateful moment both decide that if they think they can that they think they can be wise as God if they eat that fruit. And that was what the serpent tempted them with. We all know how that turned out. But you know, the, with these fig leaves now, I guess that must have been the beginning of the fashion industry as they sew those together. In the next reading, which is very, sim uh, uh, very seldom heard, as uh, John said. We look over the Apostle Paul's shoulder as he writes to his friend Philemon, a convert, and also a, a slave owner. Writing from jail, Paul is with a young runaway slave that belongs to Philemon, whom Paul has just converted to Christianity. Here on the edge between imprisonment and freedom, Paul is sending young Onesimus back to his master, but this time as a brand new Christian, like his master is. Paul's heartfelt letter reveals his fondness for the helpful young man, even though he did run away, and because we can see he probably stole from his master to get the resources to run all the way to Rome. Paul asked Philemon, to act, not out of righteousness and the law, but out of love. You see, Paul maintains, and this is very important when scripture is used wrongly to uphold such things as slavery. Paul taught that no Christian, no Christian can ever own another Christian because all Christians are equal children in the eyes of God blessed with God's grace. Paul asks his friend to take the young man back, not as a slave, but as a dear brother. And here I stand on this cold, bright Sunday in Lent, among the last days of Black History Month. I do so as an outsider. I'm not black, it's plain to see. But I have been placed on the edge of that black experience over and over again ever since I was a child. You know, there must be a reason. There must be a reason that for this to happen, and I think, I think I know why. When you look at racism through the eyes of an innocent, powerless child, you see and feel things differently, more purely. You see how the actions of grown-ups make no sense, and you feel the hurt that these actions cause, far more than full-grown adults. Some of you know from previous sermons that I grew up living in a section of the city of Syracuse that was called the island, the island. It was a so-called society section of Syracuse near the university. And there was good reason that it was called the island. There was an unwritten rule where what we lived. No Jews, no Catholics, and of course, no Negroes. The fact is my parents were passing. 
The neighbors couldn't tell by the way we looked that we were Catholic. They viewed that unacceptable group of people as drunks and people who pop babies out every year and worship plaster, plaster statues. I was told from a young age not to mention my Catholicism to the neighbors. But for the rest of people kept off the island, it wasn't so simple as it was for me. Right from the beginning, the little girl that was me felt it was all wrong. The neighborhood was made up of lots of wealthy doctors and professors, but the only people of color I ever saw were cleaning ladies and our grocery delivery boy, which is how my father called him. His name was Tracy. When Tracy padded out his tip by a couple of dollars, my father had him fired. We used to travel south for dad's business every year, where furniture and textiles are produced. And in 1957, we were invited to stay at the Callaway Plantation. It was a plantation in Georgia. It was a grand old estate with a black butler and a black maid assigned just to us. And every morning they would bring coffee on a silver tray with a camellia. I was 10, and the butler, the poor man, his entire assignment was to keep me amused all day and to, to retrieve my fishing lures from the trees when I tried to fish in the pond out front. I, I, I liked him, I just wanted to play with him. But he was always very professional. I was lonely, and I really didn't understand on the way home, we had to catch a plane at the old Atlanta airport, which is nothing like the international airport. It was an old Quonset hut with big spaces, and some of the big spaces were shared by both passengers and cargo. So there was passengers and even bales of cotton in certain parts of the, of the, the airport, which was great for me because for show and tell, I could go just go over and pick a bunch of the cottons, take it back for show and tell. But nothing prepared me for what I saw next. There, right off the waiting room, were the restrooms, clearly marked, colored men's room, colored women's room, colored water fountain, white water fountain. Even to my 10-year-old mind, I started to see that the world outside my island was just another big set of more islands where some people got to, got to go and others couldn't. Then when I was 12, my next door neighbor, a prominent doctor, decided to put, to put his house on the market after living there for many years. A couple of days later, I was looking out the window, and I saw a young black man, his cameras around his neck, walking across the front lawn in the perimeter of the house. My mother sprang into action, called her best friend up the street, and in the space of minutes, they had the, the phone lines burning up and down our street that a black man a Negro was looking at the doctor's house. I grabbed my mother, I said, Mom, no, this man is just doing his job. He's the photographer from the newspaper getting pictures for a real estate listing. My mother, whom I never thought as being racist, must have felt embarrassed by what I said because she put the phone down and she became silent. The island had changed her to its ways, too. And I knew, I knew at that moment, when I saw yet another innocent person excluded from the island, that I didn't belong there either. I was an outsider. As there was the wilderness, and there was the promised land for the right people, it was the author John 
Baithwai who said, sometimes you have to go through the wilderness before you can get to the promised land. The problem was that within the privilege of white culture, no one at that time saw any problem with America being a land of castes, a caste system, and, and no one, not even the ranks of clergy, were doing anything about it. We needed some prophets to lead us out of the wilderness, and there was nothing more powerful than the voice of religion to provide it, used in the right hands. But Martin was on his way. Martin Luther King, the imperfect person and perfect prophet who broke a few commandments of his own while he managed to pilot the civil rights movement through its infancy. A century before King, former slave Frederick Douglass identified the road out of the wilderness. And he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. Case in point that I saw, when I was 17, I went south with my father again to Troy, North Carolina, a mill town <clears throat> where 90% of the people are employed by one family. And they make chenille and braided rugs. You may have some in your home. We were guests of the owners. And Lucy Ann Capel welcomed us into her house where a butler and maid bowed profoundly down to us profoundly down to us. I have never been so uncomfortable in my life as when that happened. She then invited me to go in the car with her as she dropped off her servant staff where they lived. And as we drove, she pointed out the segregated school where the staff's children attended, all the time saying to me, hey, it's such a shame, it's so run down compared to the white school. And then we went out into the woods, drove out into the woods, where in the distance I could see some relatively recently built homes. And Lucy Ann explained in her words, you know, some fly-by-night northerners came down here and offered to build the colored folks' houses that were affordable. A lot of them signed up and gave them, and gave them they gave these men their last penny but they didn't tell him there would be no indoor plumbing. No water except what my staff can bring by the bucket from the stream a half mile away. Isn't it a shame? And yet here was Lucianne, the most powerful woman in town. And not, she not only didn't have any suggestions how to fix the schools or the houses, she also didn't have any interest in being the agent of change, to plow up the field for people still held in bondage by their race and by the white culture. Flash forward to today, are things any different for people of color? Well, yes, in many ways, but then no, in many ways. Sometimes great blessings come out of the struggle. You know, it was Marian Anderson's birthday just three days ago, our famous, beautiful soprano uh, here, here in Danbury. And it was celebrated at her museum. But I wonder how many of you know that the reason she ended up in Danbury was because she was rejected. Her husband and she were rejected for housing all over Westchester because of their race. So, like Marian Anderson, the people sang their way through the years of rejection. And in their song, they found their courage. In every, lift every voice and sing, we hear the hope of a much brighter future for all God's children together. 
and it goes sing a song full of the faith that dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won so may it be and so i speak in apology for all that has gone before and in hope for all that lies ahead of us all of us together as one amen send you on your way for your walk through the wilderness but the difference is you do have that light inside of you you have the light that hopefully we fanned the flame of this week. You have the echo of the sound of Merdina's voice and your own voices singing. You don't have to face the wilderness alone. You are part of the promised land. And so this week I wish for you, may God bring you peace, bring you strength, and bring you the love that turns every person you love and every person you meet into a brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Amen.